You're listening to the Revision Path Podcast, a weekly showcase of the world's black graphic designers, web designers, and web developers. Through in-depth interviews, you'll learn about their work, their goals, and what inspires them as creative individuals. Here's your host, Maurice Cherry. Welcome to the Revision Path Podcast. My name is Maurice Cherry, and before we get into this week's interview, let's talk about our sponsors, Facebook Design, Google Design, and MailChimp. You know, there's three things that set designing at Facebook apart from designing anywhere else. Scale, variety, and investment. Facebook Design's work has impact at scale, including your friends and family or people from the other side of the globe. Facebook Design also works on a huge and diverse range of problems, and they truly invest in design, caring deeply about how their team might do their best work. Sound interesting? Then learn more at facebook.com forward slash design. Google Design is a cooperative effort led by designers, writers, and developers at Google. They work across teams to publish original content, produce great events, and foster creative and educational partnerships that advance both design and technology. For more information on news, design resources, and their design podcasts, check them out at design.google. MailChimp is the world's leading marketing platform for small businesses, but really, it's a great marketing platform for all businesses. MailChimp grows with you, so as you get bigger, they have more features for you when you're ready to use them. So whether you're just starting out or you want to take your business to the next level, give MailChimp a try. Check them out at MailChimp.com. Now for this week's interview. We're talking to Alana Marshall, an Associate Creative Director in Chicago, Illinois. Let's start the show. All right, so tell us who you are and what you do. My name is Alana Marshall. I'm Associate Creative Director at 1035, an agency here in Chicago. My specialty is art direction specifically. What's an average day like for you at 1035? I'm always curious to kind of hear what it's like in the agency side. I've never worked on on the agency side before, so I'd love to know about that. So agency side, I don't think there's an average day. There's a lot of different components to to what we do. So it could be anything from concepting. You're at the beginning of a project and we're all brainstorming together. Our director working with copywriters or working with a larger group brainstorming. It could be designing sketches or comps to bring the ideas to life, building out presentation deck, uh, obviously presenting and selling that work into clients, which is also a, a whole other part of it traveling for a shoot day, actually going on production, could be traveling for a shoot day, actually going on production, uh, working with photographers or directors to bring that could be print out of home. It could be digital videos, TV, uh, even radio spots, recording radio. Uh, We don't do that as much anymore, but that was a, a bigger part of it when I first started reviewing edits, retouching working with the retoucher and giving feedback and making sure that the final product is is exactly the vision that that you had for that work in the first place. So there's a lot of different kind of moving parts. So every day is something different. And that's part of what I really like about working in advertising as well. Yeah, I was just saying, as you were mentioning all of those, I could see how someone might be doing each of those roles individually, but like it's all in one position where you're kind of handling all of these different things, it's almost like you're herding cats in a yeah. way, you know, when it yeah. comes to these kind of things. How did you first get interested in art direction? So I have always been really interested in visual art as a whole. So in secondary school in Barbados, where I'm from, you are able to kind of choose different routes as you go. So I chose visual art as one of my main subjects. And so I knew when I was leaving school, I wanted to do something in that field. And initially I wanted to do architecture. (laughs) And so I had done art plus math, physics, technical drawing, and I was kind of set on doing that. And one of my art teachers had great art teachers where I went to school. She found a catalog. I think she was sent a catalog for SCAD in Atlanta, Savannah College of Art and Design. And So when I looked through that, there was all these different majors that they offered. And so I was interested in so many different things. 
I found advertising design was kind of a, a balance between there was graphic design, but I also loved creative writing um, and English literature. And so I picked advertising design as my major. And you kind of have a, a period there where you can choose different classes when you, you first go to SCAD. And so when I did my first advertising class, you create a whole campaign and you kind of sell it in and and look at the insights and strategy behind it. And that really captured my imagination. I think it it utilized all the different skill sets that I had. And so I was really sold on that. And looking back now, I think I probably was not that interested in architecture. It just seemed like a fancy job <laughs> that would <laughs> justify me going to art school. But yeah, that's how I got into advertising. Well, yeah, I would imagine, you know, architecture and advertising, that's like two <laughs> entirely different. I mean, they're both design, I guess, in a way, but yeah, yeah, one is certainly more visual and conceptual and architecture is kind of like you're dealing with real world structures as it relates to that. It, yeah, it's two different kind of ends of it. There's like the imaginative, like creative part of it. And then there's very much like real world sketching out all those interior like spaces and thinking about structure and electrical and, and all that stuff. But for me, one of my biggest issues, which wasn't really an issue, was that I was interested in so many different things. Mm-hmm. So I, I did technical drawing, which is kind of the beginning of like engineering a little bit at school as well. So I, I liked that as well. So it was kind of just me trying to figure out what the best fit would be for a major. Yeah. So overall, though, what was your time like at SCAD? Do you feel like it prepared you once you got out there in the working world? Most definitely. I loved my time at SCAD. I had really great advertising professors. And I think it did prepare you. Because at the time, what I don't know if the program is different. No, at the time, the advertising program was not the same as, like, I think, Portfolio Center or Miami Ad School. I think you actually get paired up. You're going in as a art director and you're working with a copywriter, working with a strategist and different things to to put the work together. It was almost like you had to work in all of these roles to create mm-hmm. your campaign. So I did a lot of... Um, there are very few people, I think, who were there specifically for copywriting. And so I ended up doing a lot of copywriting for my campaign. You end up doing, it's a lot of work. <laughs> it's very intense. Mm-hmm. And so you kind of, you come away with the understanding, like, this is what agency life is going to be like. Like, we're pulling all-nighters. We're trying to get this work right and to feel right and to really communicate what you're trying to communicate succinctly is very, it's very difficult go through tons and tons of revisions and refinements. I think there was a a class where you did like, I think a hundred thumbnail sketches to get to what you're trying to get to. And so when I went out into the real world and I did my first couple internships, you know, people were very much like, Oh my goodness. Like, thanks so much for being a trooper and like sticking around. I was like, Oh, I thought this is, this is what I was supposed to do. Like, this Mm -hmm. is kind of what I was trying to do is kind of be prepared to work really hard to find the right solutions. Yeah. It sounds like it also kind of prepares you to be a, a generalist in a way, because you're doing so many different things in one role, as opposed to just being a specialist, like just a copywriter, just a designer, something like that. I think so. At least for me, that's what I took away from it. Like I even had, I feel like I had meetings after school where I think people didn't believe that I did all the work in my book (laughs) because usually you would write like credits, right? Like, oh, this person was a copywriter. This person was the art director and so on. And I, it was me, like I wrote it. (laughs) And so I feel like I had at least one meeting where they were like, so you did all of this? And I'm like, yes. (laughs) Written by Alana Marshall, designed by Alana Marshall, all of that. Absolutely. <laughs> so once you left SCAD, I'm interested to know kind of what the early moments of your career are like. What were those those early work experiences like? Because you said SCAD really kind of prepped you to know that the agency world is intense. Was that what those first experiences were like? So when I first left, I, first of all, it was it's pretty hard to cra- it was hard for me to crack into the agency world, and so I focused more on the design side. And so I actually worked for a while at Captain Planet uh, Foundation uh-huh. in Atlanta. And it's actually, I don't know if you remember Captain Planet. The Oh, yeah. 
the cartoon. Let our powers combine. Be yeah. aware of superhero. <laughs> <laughs> and so they did a lot of work kind of uh, giving grants uh, to organizations who, who work with kids and, and were promoting being kind to the environment and all of that. And so that was a really great experience. I got to do a lot of different things there, working on web and digital. And they even did print presentation decks and stuff like that. And I feel like every job that I had, like where even, even though I was thinking like, oh, I want to be in an agency, it does come around to contribute to what you have to offer in the end of the day. I also worked with a company that did more app design and web design. And then I went to my first internship at Mullen in Boston. Um, They're a really great agency. They do a lot of great work. And that was a fantastic experience. It was a summer internship. A whole class of interns worked together. We did our own campaign and we also worked with the you know general creative team for whatever they needed And it was a lot. Again, it was intense. You work long hours, but I think it solidified in my mind that that was for sure what I wanted to do and pursue. I don't know if people realize how much of a, I guess, like a big design city Boston is. I mean, aside Mm -hmm. from, I know, you know, MIT is there, Harvard has their graduate school of design, et cetera. But even if you look at just the architecture and things like that, every time I've been to Boston, I've been surprised by just how like robust the design culture is there. And it sounds like with advertising kind of plays into that probably as well. Yeah, there's great. There's some great agencies there as well. And now you've worked also at a number of other agencies before, you know, landing where you're at now at, at 1035 for people out there that are listening that may want to go into the agency life, but don't know what it's like. And you kind of give, I don't know, like some pros and cons, like what has it been like from, uh, from your experience? I look at it like usually if you you have a job that has really amazing perks, <laughs> there's probably a reason for that. You know, like if you go to the Facebook or Google campus and they have like, you know, amazing food and happy hours or whatever, it's probably because you guys are going to be working really hard. <laughs> and so it's the same thing for advertising. Like it's fun. Like it's really fun. You're around really creative people. You're making Work that you kind of see out in the world is very cool to go and see like an out of home ad that you did or something pop up on your social media that you created. And to be paid to to use your creative talents is very satisfying. The cons and it would depend on your personality and what you want. The cons would be, you know, you have to work very hard to try to create some kind of work life balance because it can be kind of overtaking sometimes of your life. But you'll find a lot of people, like a lot of different people that are in advertising already kind of obsessive, workaholic people. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily a con. (laughs) It's probably health wise, it might be a con. But (laughs) how do you find that work life balance? I don't find there's a lot of it. (laughs) Okay. But you have to kind of work at it. You have to stop yourself and. And have a life because that also adds to what you can you can deliver as a creative if you're out like in the world living and experiencing stuff. I know this was a while ago. I interviewed uh, Amelie Lamont. I want to say this was like episode 147 or 148 or something. And one of the things that she talked about that was important that's relevant to what we're talking about now is about how designers and creatives kind of need to find some type of a like a balance, like a wellness balance, because Mm -hmm. it's often hard enough to be able to kind of conjure up your creativity to be able to deliver between, I don't know, say the hours of nine to five or whatever, because we know creativity strikes when it does. It's not on Mm -hmm. the time clock, that sort of thing. So it can be very strenuous physically, mentally to kind of put all that out there. So she was talking about the importance of kind of having some balance to that after work so you can replenish yourself. So I totally get that. I I feel like I'm starting to, I think I was better at it a year ago. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and this is not to say before I started my job, which well, I kind of did, but before I started where I'm at now, which is not to say we don't have a work-life balance. We do. We have a pretty good work-life balance. And they're very good about kind of pulling you to the side if they see like, hey, you're, you might be doing a little bit too much right now. But I don't know. Recently, I've been trying to sort of find that balance. So it can be... It can be difficult. It's certainly something that I think 
we're all working at just trying yeah, to yeah it's, it's definitely it. important and i am better at it than it was like five years ago um it's something that you have to be aware of and know when you just need to take that time yeah <laughs> free self replenish so you have something to give yeah like i'll tell people before i get burned out that i'm i'm feeling a little crispy and usually people know what that means like my friends know <laughs> what that what, I, what that means when i say that they're like okay like Let's go out for a drink or something like that. Like they get it yeah. when I say that. So even I have to try to recognize that when it's when it's coming in so I can try to do what I can in my off time to to stave it off. So uh one thing that I see designers do and I, honestly I see this from really entrepreneurs. These are not necessarily folks that work in the advertising industry, but I'll see these terms of creative director and art director kind of used interchangeably. Um, you being an art director, specializing in art direction, what do you see as like the differences between those two roles? So in my experience, um, so a creative director can either be a copywriter or art director. So it's just a creative that has basically moved up to rank, moves up the ranks and is now kind of managing the creative team. Um, so, as an art director who's now moving into, I'm associate creative director. Um, my specialty would be that I would be more inclined to, to give direction around the visual side of it, mm-hmm. but I should also have the, the chops to also look at the copywriting, the headlines and, and the, um, the messaging and have an opinion on that as well. So in advertising, the creative director could be an art director or a copywriter. So they've kind of got their hands in multiple aspects. Yeah, like you, you're just kind of um, guiding the overall vision uh, and making sure that it's it's on the right path to what you think it should be to to sell that work in. Okay. So let's say you've got a, a new campaign that's coming up. You don't have to mention any that you're actually working on at 1035, but I'm curious, and I'm certain, sure the audience wants to know as well, how do you approach a new campaign or a new project? What's your process like? So, um, like if we're on a pitch for new business, it's a pretty intensive process, um, researching, um, working with the strategy teams to find the insight, to understand exactly who we're talking to, who our target is, um, what they need, what this product is, is really offering, what's special about it. And, so there's a lot of really wrapping your head around and understanding um, the need. And so then you're better able to, to find what that solution is and to start creating that. So you really start from a very um, conceptual place and some place of truth about what this can really offer. And then, then you go in and create the work. And that's the, the longest part of it. Some long nights um, working on pitch decks, but yeah. So who are some of your influences? Like are there people in the industry that you look up to that you, you kind of emulate in terms of your work? I think about looking up to people in advertising. Like my mind goes to kind of the advertising heavyweights kind of madman era uh lee clow did apple george lois in terms of advertising there was like an era like around the 60s like where they really developed this witty like really interesting unique ways to to look at things versus just kind of hard sell Mm -hmm. so those iconic people and advertising campaigns are always kind of a benchmark like man i would love to make something iconic that kind of makes this huge mark on culture but in general i think also i'm really inspired by not even necessarily people in advertising but just people who are able to create their own lane build their own worlds so they could be anybody from like artists like kahinde wiley like you created your own kind of very clear vision and space or somebody like George R. R. Martin with Game of Thrones, like you really built out this world and there's maps and languages and I'm really intrigued and inspired by that. Okay. Do you have a dream project like that that you would like to do one day? 
You know, when I was a lot younger, I wanted to be an author. I wanted to write. And maybe, (laughs) maybe that would be a dream project to kind of build some kind of fantasy world, bring that into the world through some kind of graphic novel or novel. But I haven't been making steps towards that, but I really appreciate it from the outside. Yeah, doing the graphic novels on my like short bucket list too. And I'm I'm like starting to make small progress, but not enough. I told myself this year this is gonna be the year that I try to make bigger, larger strides towards it, <laughs> whether it's putting something out there publicly so just other people can keep me accountable. Cause yes. I've been doing I've been doing so much of it sort of like just on my own offline, like scribbling in journals and stuff, but nothing that's actually out there that could get any sort of tangible feedback to improve. So I know what you mean. Like sometimes you can get just so caught up with your regular work that the thought of doing an additional project on top of that is a lot to to undertake. Yeah. But that that's important too. Like I definitely think that being accountable and starting to share it with other people can keep you on track. Yeah. What do you want to accomplish this year? Do you have any, any big goals for the year? I think there's more general goals for me this year. I want to, like, actually what you just said, to hold myself accountable, create some kind of outlet, whether it's like a separate Instagram, to create more of my own personal work and personal projects. Like I said, I was always very interested in art growing up, so I would paint. I was really into ceramics and sculpture jewelry making, all these different things. And so I really want to make space and time to to create my own personal work. Was it a big culture shock coming from Barbados to the States? I don't think it was a big culture shock because American culture is just so ubiquitous everywhere. Mm. So although, you know, you grow up with your very specific Barbadian, Caribbean culture, and there's soca music and all the different types of food and all these different things, you also kind of grow up alongside American culture. Mm-hmm. So I think that all of the, you know, like sitcoms and movies and music and you kind of grew up with that as well. So it wasn't a crazy culture shock. Interesting. I, I feel like maybe within the past, maybe five to 10 years, I feel like the concept, at least here in the United States, the concept of of blackness throughout the diaspora has become a lot more multifaceted mm-hmm. like from people that are from outside, you know, like from people from the Caribbean, people from Europe, people from, you know, countries in Africa, their influences, all that sort of stuff. Have you started to see that? I definitely think so. I have a playlist called like Full Island, <laughs> Full Island Beats, Full like, Island Beats. like Afro Beats. And <laughs> yeah, like I, I feel like there's a lot of different music. You'll see a lot of different even fabrics, uh, African print, uh, Kente cloth uh, being incorporated more. And just I think maybe social media has made it a lot more visible that there's all these other facets to, oh yeah to black girl magic or black boy joy or whatever i definitely really see that to see too. yeah i definitely see that from twitter like <laughs> it's so interesting i'll hear people talk about well you know south african twitter is saying this and nigerian twitter is saying that and yeah even like how they perceive memes or you know just different things in pop culture it's really interesting to see how much of that has changed so so recently yep that's the beauty of the beauty of social media. Oh yeah, I totally agree with that. Where do you see advertising going in the future? I mean, with the work that you're doing in art direction, where do you see it kind of going into the near future? I think it's an it's in an interesting space right now. I think in the past creativity was and and these kind of larger than life figures were dictating to to the clients what they were going to put out and what was going to work. And because there's so many different aspects now that I think clients have to be aware of, like you need to be aware of your social media presence, you need to constantly create content. And so there's a lot more partnerships with a lot of different media entities that are creating content. So it's just, it's a little bit 
different. It's kind of being redefined all the time. Like who are the creatives and who's creating the advertising is not necessarily just agencies. So it'll be interesting to see even within a couple of years, how agencies are defined. And I think more and more agencies are trying to, to bring on more production capabilities and to be able to quickly build, maybe build in a studio to be able to quickly put out social media content. So yeah, I'll be interested to see where it's going. It's constantly changing agency models and, and how they, what they offer. Have you started to see more of that kind of reliance on like popular social media trends? Not necessarily reliance, but definitely taking into consideration how you're getting this reach. You know what I mean? It might not be TV anymore. It might be you partnering and doing an online series with social media influencers that are really relevant to your product. So definitely taking more into account all these different facets that people are going to view your brand through. And I think definitely people are looking more at not necessarily advertising, just talking to you and here's this TV ad and it's telling you this and here's this print ad and it's telling you this, but more of integrating themselves into what you're already viewing and watching and, and not being as obtrusive, just kind of being, trying to give you a reminder that this, this brand exists and you support this <laughs> influencer. And yeah. Mm hmm. By chance, have you seen either of the Fire Festival documentaries? I have not, but I've heard a lot about them. About so, them. Yeah, so the reason I, I wanted to kind of, I guess, you know, touch into that about social media is one of the things that I think we're starting to see recently is about how there are these, I don't know, I'm loath to call them agencies, but sort of like these these social media companies or pop-ups of some sort that are managing to work with much larger brands, making you know, thousands of dollars on social media campaigns where they basically just lifted a meme or something from someone else. Mm. For example, with the Fire Festival documentary, with both of them, actually, there's a, a company called Jerry Media. Mm -hmm. And then with that, they have, a I think the social media account is called Fuck Jerry. Oh, so, yeah, yes, yeah. Yeah, and so basically what they're doing is like they're taking or repurposing memes or jokes, right. but they're... They're like slightly shifting it so it can fit in with, you know, Burger King or Wendy's or something like that, like a big brand. Yeah. And, and now we started to see backlash from it, particularly from comedians who realize that, oh, these people are stealing jokes and that's not cool. So I was wondering, like, if that sort of thing, is that something that as an art director or someone that works in advertising that you are kind of aware of? Is that something that clients like ask about? Like, oh, can we make this go viral? That sort of thing. <laughs> Yeah, I'm definitely aware of that account. And yeah, people always want to make things go viral. But I think we definitely always start from a place of we have to create our own content. Like mm -hmm. that is just, it's messed up. <laughs> like we're not going to start with seeing this other video and either hopping onto that and trying to make the brand fit in there. I think specifically for me is all about kind of creating your own content, asking to make something go viral is, <laughs> it's a little bit of a, like, that's not how that works. Yeah. Like you, you have no control over that. You try to make it as engaging as possible, make it as relevant as possible, maybe work in, work with that influencer to create content and pay them to create that content. Yeah. Not cool. And I would say even what happens at the end of the day is that company may end up getting known for that viral success, but it's never the agency. Like you'll always hear the company get lauded for, oh, they're they're taking right. this particular tone on social media or something, but it's never, hey, let's look at the ad agency that did that, unless you're reading Ad Age or something yeah, like that. I think, you know. Yeah, I think the ad people would know who did it, yeah. but maybe the outside world would never know. What keeps you motivated and inspired to continue? I think that because in... Overall, like I really love my job. I love when I'm able to just sit and create because like you talked about earlier, like you're creating this from scratch, from nothing. There's no formula for it. So every experience is different. 
every assignment is kind of a new opportunity. Like this might be <laughs> the next <laughs> hugest thing. So yeah, that keeps me really motivated and excited about work. Just the the love of creating. Mm. What advice would you give to anybody that kind of wants to take their work to the next level like you have? What would you tell them? I would tell them to to definitely there's portfolio reviews that happen. I think if you you look around your city, you could probably find them. Look at other people's books that are higher up the chain than you in advertising and see what about this makes this good. What I may may be lacking, maybe it's presentation, maybe it's your kind of attention to detail, like really take a look at at how you're presenting yourself and also um, be confident, present yourself confidently, believe, (laughs) believe, I think maybe 50% of it is believing that you are the 100% best Mm -hmm. um, ever and presenting yourself that way. Yeah, definitely for the pre- the presentation part is important. I think a lot of people have the belief down, and I'm just saying this from looking at resumes. A lot of mm-hmm. people have the belief down. Presentation, mm, not so much. Right. Need to work on the presentation. And so, yeah, I think those portfolio reviews are definitely a good idea. One thing that I tell designers is that it's important for me, like if I'm a hiring manager, for example, it's important for me to see what your design process is rather than just the finished product. Mm -hmm. So like sometimes you, you know, you'll go to a designer's website and it's all like nice, pretty pictures and mock-ups and it's like, okay, that's great. But you can see that anywhere. Like what was the process behind getting to this point? Like I want to see a case study or at least a few paragraphs or in process work to get a sense of how you got from nothing to this, not just here it is. You know, like seeing what that process is like and how you thought about color choices or fonts or what considerations did you have to make because of the budget or because of time to get to this end result? Because you just see the end result and it's like, that's nice. That's good. (laughs) Like it makes you, it certainly knows that you're capable of doing the work, but it's really what I found. It's the thought process behind it. That's what will get you hired. That's what will have people talk about you in rooms where you're not, you know, there, that's what makes people know your work when they can see kind of that process and know that, Hey, this is, this is an Alana Marshall campaign. Like, can't mm-hmm. you tell, you know, like that sort of thing. Right. What advice has kind of stuck with you over the years? What's, what's something that you've picked up? I think we, we talked earlier about work-life balance, but my dad always says everything in moderation. Mm-hmm. And I think that that kind of, it speaks to that as well, where it's just like, don't go overboard in any one way. Like even with your job, you want to do a good, you want to do a good job, but you have to calm down. Mm -hmm. We're not doing brain surgery. It's not that deep. Relax. I think sometimes it's easy to get really stressed out and really overwrought with, oh, we have to do this. We have to do that. But everything in moderation, like have a little bit of fun, do a little bit of work, do a little bit of creative exploration and just, try keep working and trying to find that balance for yourself in life. Do you feel like you're satisfied creatively? I think I definitely need to make it a priority to work on my own creative pursuits. And I I can't remember who said this, but it was a documentary about advertising. And I think maybe it was Lee Clow, but he definitely was like, don't look to your job to satisfy you creatively because it's not for you. You know what I'm saying? Like you're mm-hmm. doing this work to suit the needs of this particular client. And that that's a whole other kind of process in itself. So if you want to do work that suits your, because we're not fine artists, you know, like you're not creating yeah. this work and this is my vision and this is exactly what I want. You're creating your vision using your skills and your talent to create work that uh, speaks to this particular target and works for and communicates this message from this particular brand. But if you want to do work that's all about you and how you want to bring something to life, then you need to do that work for yourself. You need to create projects for yourself that you have kind of complete creative control over. Mm -hmm. So I think that was really good advice. 
Where do you see yourself in the next five years? Um, so I don't, I don't know if it's good or bad. I don't mm-hmm. really have a kind of mapped out five year plan. The goal for me is always to keep growing, keep evolving as a creative, adding different skill sets um, and experience, and to just be, I want to be making work that I'm really excited about. And so just to continue on a path where anything that you're doing or, or work that you're taking on is something that you absolutely are excited about doing. And that's the only, to get to a stage where that's the only thing that you're doing is kind of the, I think the overall goal. And just to kind of wrap things up here, where can our audience find out more about you and about your work online? So my portfolio site is alanamarshall.com. I also have a LinkedIn, Alana Marshall. So uh, any updates will be, would be on the website. All right. Sounds good. Well, Alana Marshall, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you really for kind of sharing just kind of a peek at what it's like working at an agency. And I, I hope that for folks that are thinking about agency life or even that are like calling themselves art directors, but might not be kind of get a <laughs> sense that there's more that goes into it than just a fancy sounding title. Like there's a lot of work. There's a lot of preparation. There's a lot of moving parts that you have to handle. And certainly I think in this interview, you've been able to kind of articulate that well and show people just, you know, not only how much goes into it, but your passion for being an art director and how much it influences you creatively. So thank you so much for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Most definitely. Thank you so much for having me. Thoughts of love are in and that's it for this week. Big thanks to Alana Marshall and thanks to you for listening. You can find out more about Alana and her work through the links in the show notes at glitch.com forward slash revision path. Also, thanks as always to our sponsors, Facebook Design, Google Design, and MailChimp. Designing at Facebook means more than just making pixel-perfect prototypes. It's designing experiences like disaster relief tools or get-out-the-vote efforts. It's working on problems that transform a number of different industries, and it also means caring about the design community and giving back to it as well. If you like influencing strategy and working alongside technical leads and engineers on a product from start to finish, then Facebook Design might be for you. Learn more at facebook.com forward slash design. Google Design is a cooperative effort led by designers, writers, and developers at Google. They work across teams to publish original content, produce great events, and foster creative and educational partnerships that advance both design and technology. For more information on news, design resources, and the design podcasts, check them out at design.google. MailChimp is the world's largest marketing automation platform. They support millions of customers from small e-commerce shops to big online retailers, and they support the creative community as well, including us. Make emails, ads, landing pages, and more all without ever leaving the site. Visit MailChimp.com and sign up for a free account today. Revision Path is brought to you by Glitch, the friendly community where you'll find the app of your dreams. Make sure you check us out at glitch.com. We're also powered by Simplecast, the easiest way for podcasters to publish and distribute audio on the internet. Check the show notes for a link to sign up for a 14-day free trial. This episode was edited by RJ Basilio and produced by me, Maurice Cherry. Our intro voiceover is by Music Man Dre with intro and outro music by Yellow Speaker. If you liked this episode, then let more people know about it by leaving us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. It only takes about a minute or so to do, and it really, really helps spread the word about Revision Path everywhere. Really helps out a lot. You can also find us on Spotify, Google Podcasts, SoundCloud, or wherever you find your favorite shows. And make sure you're following us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter as well. Just search for Revision Path. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you next time.